I'm uh, Peter Mark Verward. I'm a solutions architect here at uh, Google Cloud. And um, I specialize in um, helping customers migrate. Uh, so I go and see a lot of customers as they um, made the decision to come to Google Cloud or the, in the process think about thinking about moving to Google Cloud. I help educate them about various aspects of the cloud and uh, kind of what advantages it can offer, and also in particular, how to take what they have and what they are using and migrate that over. In the course of what I do, a question that comes up a lot is, OK, great, um, how much does this cost? What is this going to cost me? What's the bottom line? And I think that we tend to focus these conversations particularly on data processing and data processing pipelines, because I think those are more conceptually difficult to price out. Um, I think to a certain extent, if you understand um, the way that, uh, say, a web front end or a database works and the capacity that it needs to um, meet, that it's relatively straightforward to be able to price that out in the cloud, even if you're not entirely familiar with that environment. But data processing pipelines tend to bring in so many different kinds of products and so many different moving pieces that it's, it tends to be a lot more difficult. It's not impossible, um, but it, it tends to be a lot more difficult, so a lot of our conversations end up focusing on that. And so what I'd like to do right now is just um, walk through what those conversations are like that I go through with um, the customers that I meet and kind of help you out in giving you some sort of context and um, guidelines towards uh, doing this on your own. Um, but first, I just want to start out with kind of a relatively simple metaphor. Um, what am I pointing to? I'm pointing to nothing. There. So think for a second if um, you could try to purchase uh, energy for your home for like the next three years, all in once. Um, do you think it'd be possible to kind of get that number exactly right? Uh, do you think you could do it efficiently so that you're not overpaying? Um, do you think you could do it in such a way that would actually make sense? I mean, like, what would happen if you bought not enough energy or you bought way too much and your lights are on all the time? So this is why I think companies that are approaching the cloud um, are sometimes confused by the way we, um, things are priced, the way products are priced, is that it's fundamentally different from the way people are used to uh, pricing out infrastructure and pricing out resources. Uh, it can be very confusing. This, by the way, is the head of the SA program. This guy named uh, Miles Ward. Uh, we frequently um, make gifts of each other and use them in presentations because I think it's hilarious. <coughs> so the reason why it's different and the, the reason why I use that kind of uh, the energy um, analogy is because cloud pricing is utility pricing. Um, it's based on what you use. It's not something that is pre-provisioned. And I think that's a mind shift from somebody who's coming in with a, a, a expectation of the way things are purchased um, inside a data center. And so if you look at the way cloud pricing is, if you're familiar with how a data center works, I think it can be um, somewhat confusing. Uh, so if you approach this from somebody who's got a uh, good understanding, who's like, I, I know how to price out in the next three, five years, whatever that is, within a reasonable um, amount of accuracy, given a certain amount of growth, but I come and look at what the cloud offers, uh, that is different from what I'm looking at. So if you look at things like uh, services that are charged by, say, um, the amount of storage per month, um, things that are, have streaming and batch processing, and then products with storage and streaming and querying pricing, this is all very different. It's all bundled together in very, very different ways if you're used to being able to purchase something as a physical device. And so if you come to that and you think, does this make sense? If somebody asks you, like, here's how cloud storage, here's how BigQuery is priced, does this make sense? Sometimes, maybe, actually, I'm not really sure. And so these are the kind of current conversations that we want to have with our customers um, and say, like, this is, this is how you can make sense of what this is and how you can make sense of what we're doing and how that maps to what um, you're used to. And so we t take the, uh, the conversation through to this is where um, a lot of data center pricing is and, and kind of how you should see that relate to uh, what, what the cloud does. So there are generally two ways that you can pr purchase capacity in a data center. And the first way um, is regular capacity planning. You have some sort of regular time frame where you buy things. Uh, you have 
a certain amount of capacity that you buy during that uh, time frame, whether it's by some sort of metrics, some sort of decision process, whatever it is, it's a regular path that people follow. And the other way is when you fall out of that pattern where there's some sort of out-of-band purchase for whatever reason, um, and you're making something off schedule. But purchasing capacity for a data center isn't just you know, buying new servers, it's buying stor storage media, buying racks, power, networking, routers, switches, whatever the case may be, um, you know, space even, hiring new people. These are all things that, um, oh, thank you. These are all things that uh, are affected by the purchasing that you make. Does that work? Seems like not, in any case. Um, so what's wrong with that? I mean, there are lots of customers and there are a lot of companies out there that are highly successful. They're running in data centers. That's not connected, OK. Um, and they're doing just fine. People are running highly successful businesses in just, oh, OK, I'm sorry about that. It works. Um, oh, yeah, it does. So. There are lots of companies that are kind of highly successful at doing this, and so why kind of change the way <clears throat> things are priced? And I think at Google Cloud, we, we, we feel like this method of purchasing is not ideal. And let's kind of talk about why. So in the first scenario, why this might not be ideal, let's say uh, you're on a development team, uh, you've created a new product, you've created a new feature, whatever that is, you need extra capacity. You reach out to operations, say we need X kind of capacity, and the answer is hopefully yes. And hopefully being able to deploy something isn't the best strategy. <clears throat> the worst answer, of course, is if you, rather than getting a hopefully yes, you can get definitely not. We're out of capacity until the next cycle. That's also bad, because then whatever you plan on releasing to your customers, whatever needs to come out there, whatever work your team has done is not going out there. And so that's not a great experience. On the other hand, if you're doing capacity planning, um, the two scenarios you see your capacity at is either you are under-provisioned when you've purchased something new and people have not fully moved in yet, or you are over-capacity or you are oversubscribed. People are not able to use as much capacity as they would like to because you don't have enough. And neither of those scenarios are ideal. In the out-of-band purchase, it's similar, there are similar issues, except what you're coming across now is because this is unusual, because it's not planned, each one of these is kind of this own unique snowflake of an, uh, of an issue. And so a development team has created something new. Hey, management says this has to go out now. We need the capacity. It's got to support a million users. And operation says, OK, what does a million users mean in terms of how many cores do we have to buy? How, many, how much storage do we need? And it depends dramatically on the use case. And so you have this point where either operations needs to translate what the development team has told them and hopefully come up with accurate numbers as to what that might mean for the hardware to purchase, or the development team says, we're going to guess that what we need is this much cores and this much RAM, and we think we're right. And that translation is not easy, even for people with a lot of experience. It can go wrong, and it's, it's frequently um, difficult to do. Or worse yet, maybe you've created a feature and nobody has any idea how much capacity you need. This is a, something totally new. We're testing something out. We could be totally wrong. We have no idea what to ask for. Or again, you have somebody who says, you know what, this is going to be the hot new thing. We're going to do great. We're going to need millions and millions of users. And it comes out and actually not that many people. So you got all this wasted capacity. The other end of the spectrum is like, you know what, it's a tiny little feature. No one will ever see it. And suddenly it becomes the next new thing. So all these sorts of things lead to problems with the way that uh, purchasing happens. And so. We think at Google Cloud, we can try to help change the way people think about purchasing what they need, purchasing infrastructure, and um, supporting the, the applications that they want to deploy. So we designed um, Google Cloud pricing to be uh, as flexible um, for customers as possible. Um, we're not trying to make you commit to long-term pricing, to choose machine types, to choose zones, to choose regions. We want to be flexible for customers. Um, so we've done a number of things that kind of enable this. Um, one of them is like sustained usage sustained use discounts, which um, give you a discount at the end of the month, depending on how long you've run your virtual machines without any interaction from you. We're just saying, OK, you used it for this long. This is what the discount is. It just happens. Um, things like pre uh, preemptible virtual machines, which are great for batch and interruptible workloads where you just need more capacity but have the um, ability to be able to stand to lose a worker or two. Those are great because you can run these data processing pipelines that require a lot of um, capacity, but you can stand to lose some things. And 
it just keeps going, picking up new uh, preemptible virtual machines at like something like 80% of the cost of a regular virtual machine. And finally, per minute billing. So actually billing you by the minute for the virtual machines you're running um, so that you're really only just paying for the things you use, which is kind of the way we think cloud pricing should work inherently. Custom machine types was something uh, interesting that we launched, I think, uh, last year, maybe the year before. Um, because we saw a lot of customers um, asking, it's like, look, um, we've got these workloads that say, I need um, 20, 24 cores to run um, X workload. And you've got 16 core machines, you've got 32. So I'm constantly over-provisioning, spending a lot more money than I actually need to. And we kind of don't want you to do that. Uh, everything at Google runs on top of a container. So our virtual machines actually also run on top of containers. It actually gives us a lot of flexibility in how we design and how we build out our virtual machines. So we said, well, we have a standard set of instance types. We feel like they meet a lot of general use cases. If they don't meet your use case, then design it yourself. Here, you can put the, together what kind of, um, however much CPU, however much RAM you need, and then you can actually right size your workloads. And what we've seen is it's had a huge impact where a lot of customers say, you know what, okay, this actually fits my workload. I am not over provisioned. I'm not paying for more than I need. And like the, the slide says, up to like 19% savings versus before when you were constantly over provisioning if you weren't quite where we um, created these standard instance types. Um, we constantly support as much of the open source community as we possibly can. We're big fans of the open source community. We contribute to it a lot. Um, things like TensorFlow, like Apache Beam, um, like our white papers for uh, MapReduce and Bigtable and all these sorts of things. And the reason we do that is because we know customers are using a lot of these third-party tools, a lot of open source tools in everyone, everywhere is using something somewhere like that. And we want to be able to support everyone. And what we don't want to do is have a platform where you're using our platform and staying on our platform because you can't leave, because you've got proprietary APIs, because you've got proprietary um, inoperable or in interchangeable services with something else that you want to use. And so if you bring in your data to Google Cloud Storage, if you bring in to Dataproc, if you bring in to BigQuery, and then one day you want to move it out, you know what, actually, BigQuery is not doing it for me. I want to use this other tool. Uh, Bigtable isn't quite right for this use case. I'm going to drop it into Cassandra. We want to be able to support that and have the interoperability. We don't want to keep you locked in. We want you to use Google Cloud because you want to use Google Cloud, because you find it the most advantageous. And so it should be kind of obvious now that the way we consider pricing and the way we price things is based entirely on how you use it and for how long you use it and how much you're consuming, rather than asking you to ever kind of pre-provision and pre-approve or, or try to figure out in advance how much capacity you're going to be using. Um, so within that lens, I think the difference between buying physical hardware and managing, say, a data center, managing racks and all those sorts of things versus how you manage capacity planning in the cloud starts to make a lot more sense. Um, and so with that in mind, what I'd like to do is just walk through a few of the, well, not a few, most of the data processing related services that we have and kind of talk about the way they're priced um, and talk about ways that um, we see customers kind of looking for uh, you know, particular cost drivers in how they're being used. Um, and again, the reason why I like to focus on data processing as opposed to say um, compute, like container engine or compute engine or so on, is I think because so many of these things tie in together and that data processing um, environments tend to be much more complex, um, that it, it's important to understand how these are individually priced and then how they're priced together. So the first one I'm going to talk about is PubSub. PubSub is uh, scalable messaging push-pull um, globally. This is another one of these services that Google uses extensively internally. Um, we, we use PubSub messaging constantly, and so this is the same service that's exposed to cloud customers. Um, PubSub recently changed its pricing to be only based on storage, which actually makes this pretty easy. There are no multiple dimensions to watch. It's nothing for me to really explain. It's all storage. So how much storage are you actually consuming on PubSub? Um, and so it's not uh, pre-provisioning topics, it's not pre-provisioning messages, it's not pre-provisioning um, kind of anything. It's how much storage are you putting out on PubSub, and that's the real cost driver. Cloud storage, uh, scalable object storage, uh, similar to PubSub, it's based on how much storage are you using, how much data are you putting in there, and that's how much we charge. We're not going to, again, ask you to pre-provision anything, it's just what is in there, what goes out there. Um, the thing to watch for cloud storage is there are multiple storage classes. Uh, and this is, 
This is interesting and useful because each of these storage classes have uh, different use cases and useful use cases, um, but it depends on kind of what you're using them for. Uh, Multi-regional, uh, like the slide says, it's really good for um, lowering the latency to end users, to getting um, your data to end users as quickly as possible from your storage buckets. It's not about caching, but actually pushing out unique data to your end users as quickly as possible. Um, those are available across continents. So you can have multi-regional US, multi-regional Europe, multi-regional Asia. And it'll spread the data around those areas. Yes? Uh, could you wait? Could you just remember it for the end, please? Could you remember the question for the end, please? We will have a Q&A. Oh, that's fine. Right, thank you. Um, so uh, near line and cold line are varying levels of archival storage, um, depending on how frequently they're accessed. And then subsequently, um, they're cheaper, depending on that. Uh, regional storage is kind of what it sounds like. It stays within the region. And I think for most data processing pipelines, regional storage is what most customers end up using because a lot of uh, data processing involves data locality. So you want your data to be nearby so it can interact with various services as you use them. Um, so regional storage tends to be what customers end up using uh, for data processing. And this one I will have to read. So um, for some perspective, uh, a terabyte in regional storage in the US uh, cost $20.48 for one month, and a petabyte for one month is $20,971.52. Um, so just some range of numbers there. So Cloud Big Table is a scalable high-speed NoSQL database. Um, it's priced essentially across uh, two dimensions, of across how many nodes you've provisioned and how much storage you're actually using. Um, so the Important things to note here, there are three. One, um, you have to uh, provision at least three nodes. And two, uh, the storage can be either SSD or high uh, spinning disk, hard drive disks. Um, and three, like the balance between, this is one of the few cases where we, you do actually pre-provision, is the balance between pre-provisioning nodes for um, query capacity or um, operational capacity versus storage, which is just build as you consume it. So <clears throat> when we get questions about how do you price out big table, you know, what's the big cost driver? Um, unfortunately, this is kind of where guidance um, gets a little more difficult because as a database, it's got a huge variety of use cases. So it's going to depend significantly on um, how you use it. But some loose guidelines. Uh, if you find that you're using big table to drive a lot of um, operations, you're doing a lot of reads and writes, um, then the number of nodes that you have tends to um, be the big cost driver. If, on the other hand, you're storing a lot of data and you're not doing a lot of um, operations, then obviously storage is going to be more significant. But that might be a scenario where you start considering, is Bigtable the right choice for this use case? And this is a little tangential from this, cost, but it from this talk, but it comes up so often, is you know there are a lot of storage products, there are a lot of database products available on Google Cloud. Which one's the right one for what I'm doing? Because it seems like a few of them could actually do this use case, could, could cover this use case. And the answer is often, well, yeah, actually, you're right. A few of them could cover that use case. And so you know, sometimes the data actually tells you fairly obviously what you should be doing. You know what? I need um, something that's strongly consistent. I need relatable tables. Um, and uh, I only need it to be in this one zone. OK, that's a SQL database. Um, I don't really have relatable data. I've got something that's super, super high speed, lots of reads and writes. I'm not going to be storing it. But OK, that's, that's probably a big table. But there's a lot of use cases that kind of fall in the gray areas in between different product types. And so <clears throat> figuring out which one to use and which one's the best for each scenario can actually be, it can be difficult to, to figure out without knowing more about the specific use case. And that usually generally comes down to a bit of experience, a bit of uh, best practices, and a bit of experimentation. So now this discussion about um, whether you should be using Bigtable or Data Store, if you're storing a lot of data but not doing a lot of traffic, it's going to depend a lot on what a lot of traffic actually means. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway. Um, Final part about uh, Bigtable is the, the cost driver is in terms of storage. Are you using SSDs or are you using hard drives? If you've ever purchased uh, storage before for pretty much anything, it's the same rule. SSDs perform more quickly, um, but are more expensive. So Databrock uh, is a managed Hadoop and Spark service. Uh, so it is 
the same Hadoop that you could download and run your own. Uh, it's just managed by us. We put it on top of virtual machines. Uh, Dataproc is actually, the pricing is very straightforward. It is just a um, additional charge on top of the virtual machines that are running underneath. So the regular compute engine charges uh, remain, and then we put a, um, an additional charge on for um, how much data proc you're using. So again, the finding out or, or, or trying to explain what is a typical use case on data proc is, is kind of difficult. There's a lot of versatility to what you can do with Hadoop, a lot of different use cases. Um, and so having specific guidelines tends to be uh, very difficult unless you know more about the use case. Broadly, really, really broadly speaking, if um, they are temporary clusters, if they are transient clusters, the number of cores tends to be the biggest cost driver. If it's a permanent cluster, it tends to actually skew the other way in the amount of storage that you have provisioned for the, cl uh, for the cluster. But again, it's highly dependent on use case. Cloud Dataflow is our next generation um, stream and uh, batch processing tool. Again, this is based on a lot of work that we've done internally, based on like Millwheel and uh, Flume Java. Uh, and this tends to be more of the kind of uh, data processing work that Google uses internally. Uh, Dataflow prices in two, use, in two kind of different cases, um, prices whether you're running a batch job or whether you're running a streaming job. And within that, then it just prices on what are the resources you're consuming? What are you consuming in terms of cores, in terms of RAM, in terms of um, storage? So when using Dataflow, again, this is going to sound a bit repetitive um, because it's the same sort of story as it is for uh, Dataproc. It depends so much on the kind of use case. And with like ETL um, tools, with data processing tools, um, especially things that sit so core to what so many companies do, the kinds of prices that uh, it can drive vary, very, very wildly. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to come up with very, very specific guidance. But loosely speaking, what you want to look at when you're adding data flow to a particular data processing pipeline is whether this is going to be batch or it's going to be streaming, and also important to note and kind of nice, data flow also charges by the minute. Um, so by the minute for the resources that you're actually consuming. And BigQuery. So BigQuery is uh, Google's uh, no-ops, um, massively scalable data warehouse. That's actually also one of our older um, cloud products and also it used extensively internally um, as Dremel. Um, other than that, it's actually almost exactly the same thing. <coughs> so BigQuery essentially uh, charges you on two dimensions, on the amount of storage you're actually using and the amount of queries that you're running, uh, which is actually really straightforward. So storage is storage. It's what you put in. It's what you're consuming. Um, no pre-provisioning, except that if data remains untouched for an extended period of time, uh, BigQuery actually ages it into cheaper storage automatically for you. Queries are, again, relatively straightforward. It's charged on the number of queries that you're, or the amount of data that you're run per query is uh, the amount you're charged. Um, and so that's relatively straightforward to understand, although a lot of customers approaching BigQuery kind of don't have a good sense of, well, how much data do my queries consume? And so there's a bit of experimentation that has to happen there. Um, there is one other thing with BigQuery in that uh, we have also added um, flat rate pricing, which um, basically means that you can query as much as you want uh, per month, and you're just paying one flat rate. So if you've got a scenario where you're using a lot, a lot of queries, say you've created um, a data set or, or tables for um, a group of analysts, then you, know, you can say, you know what, guys, we're not even going to worry about how many queries you're going to make. Go nuts. We've done flat rate pricing. Um, Generally speaking, the cost drivers kind of depend on what you're using uh, BigQuery for. We see broadly about two models, one where uh, BigQuery is constantly having lots and lots of data added to it more and more over time, um, and queries kind of happen in line with that, but generally the data tends to drive uh, the price there more. The opposite side is where you've got data that's relatively fixed in terms of how long it's there. Um, but lots and lots of queries, and so more of an analytical use case in that then the uh, queries tend to drive the cost there more. So that's just a, an overview over the, the different products that we have available um, in terms of data processing. There's obviously a lot more uh, that we could go into. There are a lot of databases that I didn't really touch on, like Cloud SQL, Expander, um, data, data Store. Um, 
but I feel like the ones that we covered are really the ones that are very essential and almost always used in some capacity in data storing, uh, in data processing pipelines. So while that's interesting, I feel like it's not really entirely useful to talk about products in the abstract unless you can talk about how they all work together. And I feel like putting products together in how they work is really one of the more useful things to do. And so one of the missions of the solution architecture team is to help customers figure out how to glue all the different products together. And actually, that's generally speaking for most of the people on my team, that's actually what we really super enjoy doing. It's uh, not talking about XYZ product, but talking about how all these three products work together to make something awesome. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is actually walk through a few uh, three example architectures focus on kind of data processing. Um, I got these architectures from my colleagues, and we have a, uh, a kiosk actually out on, on the floor, on all three floors. So there's one here, there's one on the second floor, and there are two downstairs in the main expo hall. Um, there, we call them treehouse. So basically you can go in there and search or click around for a whole variety of use cases, different industries. Um, different verticals start clicking into specific use cases, and a lot of architectures pop up. Details, pricing, why you use this, why you use that. And there's always a member of our team um, kind of sitting there to, or standing there to explain how they're used. Um, so we're, I'm going to steal three of those uh, and walk you through them. This picture, by the way, uh, was about nine months ago. We had a bit of a team meeting face-to-face, -face, which we rarely get to do because we're pretty, uh, pretty well spread around the globe. And that was in Seattle, and that's me in the corner not paying attention. So the first one we're going to go through is a very common one that we see. It's called log processing. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, but even with that being said, we're still using several different data processing um, services to kind of collect and uh, analyze the data. And so how do you price something like this? So approaching this, how do you, how do you price that out? Um, because you're using so many different services. But actually, when you can look at this, is that it only comes down to about two different things. First, how quickly are the logs coming into this architecture um, is going to be a big cost driver. And then secondly, how much storage are you using? So the inbound data, the streaming data, is going to be really affected by or is going to really affect uh, log collection. It's going to affect the streaming or batch processing in Dataflow and the ingest into, um, into BigQuery. The storage, on the other hand, is going to be the big cost driver for cloud storage, obviously. But the nature of this environment means that it's actually relatively transient on cloud storage. It's not staying there long term. The storage is really coming out of BigQuery. And so even though we're using several different services here, you can actually break this down into just kind of two broad buckets. How quick is the rate of ingest? And that's going to affect the, um, the cost of PubSub, of pasta, uh, the cost of uh, Dataflow. And how much storage am I putting into BigQuery in the end? <coughs> the second one uh, is time series analysis. This one is a little more complex, um, but Actually, looking at it the same way that we looked at the previous one, I think we can start breaking it down. So the first important point is that it's similarly to the first one, the rate of ingest is going to be a very big cost driver into looking at what it affects on PubSub and Dataflow. Now, the second thing is what's going on down here, the downstream end of this architecture um, is going to be a significant cost driver. It looks, well, I mean, it is very complicated. Um, there are a lot of different things going on, basically, because you can interact with a lot of our different, different tools in different ways to get different results out of them, whether you're using uh, machine learning to run predictions, whether you're using Data Lab to do uh, more interactive queries for, uh, say, data scientists, if you're using a, a database to do queries, whatever the case may be, there's a lot of versatility and a lot of interplay between there. But despite all that, so that we're using six separate services right there at the, at the far end there. Really, it actually comes down to two things that you need to concern yourself with. Because all you're doing right now is you're analyzing and storing. So the analysis is driven primarily by how much compute you're consuming. And storage is storage. So are you doing a lot more analytics relative to how much you're storing? In which case, the compute cost of that far end is going to um, be a bigger cost driver. On the other hand, is this mostly a storage system? And you're storing a lot of data in, in less frequently um, doing queries over it, in which case the, the storage is going to be the cost driver. And the other thing, actually, this is very important, not so much for the previous one, 
for this, but in this case, in the, in the next case, not everyone's gonna use every single part of these architectures that we design. We have customers who've Im implemented all of them, but not necessarily every part of every architecture that you see. So in this case, let's say, you know, you have no use for machine learning out of this, or you don't really wanna use data lab, uh, or whatever the case may be, um, that significantly um, decreases the level of complexity in terms of figuring out what this is gonna cost. And then finally, um, complex event processing. So I think this architecture is uh, very appropriately named. There's a lot going on here. <clears throat> but I think we can use what we talk about in the first two to kind of help um, figure out what's going on here and, and give yourself clues to be able to plan out how to, um, how to price this out appropriately. So first off, we have the amount of data that's inbound. So the rate of ingest is always going to be a big cost driver. That's going to affect how you use PubSub. It's going to affect how you do streaming uh, jobs on Dataflow. And then on the back end, how much are you querying? How much are you storing? How much are you, being, how much are you using this for? How long are you keeping this storage? Is this long term, the final destination? Is this something that needs to be held on to for regulatory reasons? Is this something you need to keep um, for whatever reason, maybe you need to keep it forever, in which case storage is going to incrementally just take over the cost of everything else. Or is this some sort of system where we're processing something, we're getting some sort of analytics out of it, we're getting some sort of result, and then it's being aged off later on to, say, um, archival storage um, classes in cloud storage. And so those kinds of things are going to be key to be able to understand what is going to be the big cost driver here. Um, and again, like the previous one, while we have customers that have deployed this particular architecture, we have not, actually we probably do have somebody who's done all of it, but for the most part, people don't necessarily do all of it. This is, this is one in particular is very much kind of a smorgasbord of uh, architecture. You're gonna pick the parts that make sense for you, whether you, you know, maybe you don't need batch processing coming out of your data center, or maybe you don't have a rules execution engine, maybe you don't wanna use Dataflow, um, maybe you have nothing to push down to downstream users, whatever the case may be, you don't necessarily have to implement the whole thing. And again, that makes uh, the job of appropriately pricing this out um, significantly less complicated. So however you do that, I think um, it's important to have an understanding of the, the products that are being used and how they, they price. But I think it's a lot more important to see them work together before you can really come up with a, uh, an accurate representation of what you're actually going to be spending. So you can say, well, I think I'm pushing about a million messages through PubSub a month. Uh, what's that going to cost me overall when I move? It's like, well, that, that's an interesting question, but how are those messages being used? What are you doing with them? How long are you retaining them? What's the policy and, and where are they coming from? Where are they going to? It's, it's much more difficult to think about singular um, products and how much they're going to cost without finding out how much they're going to do. And so this is a kind of exercise that we go through on the um, on the uh, Solution Architect team and actually other teams do this a lot too, say, all right, tell us about everything you're using and then we can start working together and figuring out how much that's gonna cost. And so part of, this is all kind of part of the process that we go through a lot with customers. And what we do also, and um, this can be very helpful, is actually work with our pricing calculator and say, okay, well, this is kind of our ballpark numbers. This is what we think it'll cost based on what you've told us, based on what your usage is. Um, here, let, let's come up with a few numbers. And so what I'd like to do is actually walk through that right now. So, um, oh, before I do that, actually, what I'm going to do is, is try to price out this architecture. But first, uh, I'm going to kind of say what exactly we're, we're going to try to price out. So what I'm going to avoid is the non kind of data focus. I just lost, oh, no, I'm back. Uh, avoid the data. Um, the, the non-data processing aspect. So the inputs, especially from on-premise and uh, the cloud application up there, and then the outputs. So um, onto downstream systems, onto App Engine, and Data Lab, I am going to skip simply because its use cases can vary so wildly. It's actually quite difficult to price out um, without knowing a lot more specifics. But the rest of this, we're going to try. Oh, and one other thing, um, I'm just going to arbitrarily make the rule execution engine um, data proc because there's a lot of data flow going on, so I want some variety. But now let's hop into the calculator. There, here we go. You guys, could you switch? What's going on here? What's going on here? There it is. Okay. So 
This is um, the, uh, oh, this is actually just the home page. So I'm going to walk you through this. If you go over to pricing, um, there's a lot of things going on here on this page, uh, a lot of really interesting information. But what we want are the calculators. And we're going to go down to the pricing calculator. There are a few other things here that are interesting, and I suggest you take um, some time to take a look at them. But you don't need to look at that right now. So first one we're going to look at, we're going to look at cloud storage. And um, let's say we're processing, well, that looks weird. Um, let's say we're processing 10 terabytes a month. And we're going to use that uniformly across all these different devices. So that's 10 terabytes of cloud storage. That's $200 a month. All right, that's pretty good. Um, BigQuery, let's stick with our 10 terabytes. 10. Streaming inserts, another 10. And why not? We're going to do 10 terabytes of queries. Um, and that's not bad. That's a little under $1,000 a month. And this is where you can also see the flat rate pricing. And then we, what is going on here? OK. No, oh, come on. There we go. OK, data. OK, so I'm on Dataproc. So master nodes tend to not um, consume uh, a lot of resources, depending on your use case, pretty strongly. Um, in this case, I'm going to go for something that's mostly middle of the road. I'm going to use an eight uh, standard. But we are going to use preemptible VMs um, as our worker nodes. The calculator will automatically add two regular virtual machines, which you have to have when you use preemptibles. Um, but for the most part, we're going to use uh, the preemptibles. And we're going to add, I don't know, 20? 20 sounds like a good number. Um, ours, this cluster is going to run per month. Uh, let's say the batch jobs run twice a day. Um, so it's going to run 60 times a month. Let's say it runs for about it's three hours each time, so that's six, six hours a day. Um, I think that's 180 hours per month. Um, yeah. Oop, wait. Don't do that. So let's add that to the estimate. And that is, how much is that? Oh, $172 a month. That's not bad. All right, let's go back because I scrolled too fast. And now, all right, well, I'm going to save data flow for last. And we have to add some big table and pub sub. So big table, we're just going to do the minimum. We're going to add three nodes. Each node provides um, 10,000 uh, operations per second, essentially. So a minimum size storage node is uh, 30,000 uh, per second. So I think that should be sufficient for this particular use case. And we're going to add another 10 terabytes of SSD, and that is going to cost us a little over $3,000 a month. And then PubSub, again, super easy. Only the amount of storage that we're going to be using. And that is going to cost us $600 a month. All right, now let's get back to Dataflow. Nope, wrong direction. Or, yeah, here we go. So we're gonna, we have two types of jobs in that um, particular architecture. We've got a <coughs> batch and stream. So let's do this one. So we said we're going to do this twice a day. So let's just say 30 days per month. So we're going to do it 60 jobs, 60 jobs per month. Um, let's do 50 CPUs. And, oh, no, 50 CPUs and 100 gigs of RAM. And again, one terabyte of storage. And how much does that cost? Let's put in PubSub or Dataflow. Nearly two hundred dollars. All right. Now let's try streaming. Um, again, fifty CPUs, hundred gigs of RAM, one ter or ten terabytes. And we got that. And that costs. Oh, well, that costs four dollars. All right, I think we should spend more money on data flow because four dollars is just not enough. Um, let's be silly. Let's just add ten times the capacity. So wait, was that right? That's a thousand. Yeah, okay. Um, same storage. Data flow streaming, thirty-six dollars. No, I want more. 
Um, so it's running all month long. That's 720 hours a month. So I've got to have at least a CPU per hour. So let's just do 1,000 CPUs um, and just make this a silly number. So data flow is now up to $105 per month, um, adding a lot of RAM and CPU. So that's fantastic. Um, so if you look at this, overall, that entire architecture ends up costing a little over $5,000 a month, with me probably going a little overboard on uh, pricing out data flow. Most of this cost is actually driven by what BigQuery uses and what Bigtable costs. So the rest of all that streaming, um, uh, the storage on, on cloud storage, pubs up, all that stuff actually is not a significant cost driver to that. Um, but one other neat thing that I actually really like about this, uh, this tool is you can slide around just, okay, what would this cost me per day? But also, I think more usefully, is like, what is the quarterly cost? What is the annual cost? So the annual cost for that particular pipeline, assuming all the numbers stay relatively close, is about $60,000, which is really not bad, um, and, but very much in line with the cost that we've seen um, other customers do running similarly complex uh, um, data processing pipelines. So we're back. So I think um, you know walking through that exercise is helpful. Uh, I hope it's been helpful. Um, I hope like that that is you know giving you a little more understanding. Um, this is my manager. Uh, like I said, we liberally use uh, GIFs of each other, and I think this one's hilarious as well. <coughs> so that exercise, actually, that's something that we very commonly do, is walk through um, data pricing uh, on the calculator and help give uh, customers some sort of perspective of what these actually mean if you start attaching numbers to them. And once you know, then, as the saying goes, knowing is half the battle. But in reality, you have to face the other half of the battle. And what good is knowing what you can do if you don't know how to control how much cost um, is going to go on your, on, your processing, uh, on your data processing pipelines, on your environments, whatever you're using. You need to be able to control. Otherwise, um, you know, pricing it out is kind of nice in theory, but then you don't know what, you know, what to do, and what to, how to stop it. And so I'd like to talk, or I'd like to finish off the talk by just uh, walking through ways you can control how much you spend on the cloud. And the first step actually has nothing to do with budgeting or cost controls, but actually it's monitoring. So if you're not monitoring environments, if you're not monitoring what you're doing on your data processing pipelines, you literally have no idea what's going on. You have no idea, um, <coughs> excuse me, what developers are doing, you have no idea what your systems are doing, you have no idea how much you've spent, you have no idea where you're going, you have no idea how to do any of this. And so monitoring is absolutely essential. It's essential for a lot of other reasons other than cost control, but it's essential for cost control as well. Um, if you're not using monitoring yet, I strongly recommend Google Stack Driver. I think it's a terrific tool. It monitors a lot of great things, a lot, monitors a lot of things um, on the cloud. It actually monitors a lot of things on AWS as well. You can put agents in your data center and monitor things. Um, so Stack Driver has a lot of versatility. Um, there are some terrific third-party tools out there that people use for monitoring. There have been customers who have written their own terrific monitoring tools. Um, when I go to a customer, really, uh, all I want to see is that somebody's monitoring something with, with any tool that's competent. You're monitoring the right things. You're, you're looking at alerts. That's all I really care about. Um, so that, that is really like a message I can't really kind of harp on enough, is that how important it is to have monitoring and have monitoring for things that matter and things that are important. <clears throat> so that's step one. So step two, um, you can actually set budgets in Google Cloud. You can set it in the console. Um, you can go into any project. You look at how much it was spending or it spent in the last month. Uh, you can set a budget there. You can set budgets on whatever number you want. And then you set alerts on certain percentages of where that uh, spend is. And so that, that way you can actually monitor throughout the month as, the, as you spend what things are doing, how things are going, um, how much has been spent. So it's not, it doesn't come to you at the end of the month like a surprise, like a cell phone bill over how much you've spent. This is actually a great way to do cost. Um, control and cost monitoring. Next, you can take advantage of some of the features built into um, the products themselves. So both BigQuery and Cloud Storage have different storage classes that cost different. Um, cloud Storage has uh, the four different um, 
classes that we looked at earlier. There's multi-regional and regional, but there's also nearline and cold line. Nearline and cold line are designed for archival storage with increasingly rare um, access. So nearline, we ballpark it, say, do you need to see this once a month or less? Um, cold line is, do you need to see this once a year or less? Um, and those are generally the guidelines, but you can take advantage of those because they cost significantly less. If you're not touching this data, you're not touching this data for a while, and you need to keep it around, don't put it in regular regional storage. It's just a total waste of money. Um, similarly, with BigQuery, BigQuery ages off the data into cheaper storage if you haven't touched it for 90 days. And so you can take advantage of that. It's like if we're only querying relatively hot data, if we're only querying relatively recent data, then just let that age off. Don't query that if you don't actually need to touch it. Data flow, um, because it's a unified programming model for um, batch or stream, it lets you actually use that versatility long term. So let's say as a company, um, you know, you're processing X log data for whatever reason um, in batch mode, because that makes sense when you started doing that. But actually, long term, you've grown, you've switched directions, you want to try something new, you want to try something different. Dataflow gives you versatility to change from batch mode to stream mode by changing two things. There are two differences in these uh, code samples and only one additional line. That is enormous amounts of developer time saved just by using Dataflow so that you have long term versatility to change your mind, to change what you're doing, change how you work. And then Data proc, um, this is one, one thing I think that kind of goes unnoticed is that because it just sits on top of, of Compute Engine, it uses all of Google Compute Engine's um, storage uh, methods. And so sustained use discounts, um, per minute billing, preemptible VMs are all just ready out of the box for data proc. There's nothing to enable, there's nothing to change, nothing to switch. And so you can take advantage of those cost um, features uh, whenever you want there. And though, finally, you can control the rate of access with different um, tools. And so let's say you are processing in some logs, again, from somewhere that you don't control, something that, somebody that uh, an external third party is just feeding you um, data that you're, is not under your control. How do you control how quickly that comes in? Um, what if they send way too much for you to handle at a, at a certain cost level that you're comfortable with? Well, with PubSub, you can set up a topic that's a pull topic, and when the data gets sent into PubSub, PubSub can control how quickly to acknowledge and say, yes, I've received your message, send me another one. And so you can actually control the rate of ingest just with PubSub with the tooling that's already in there. And then with BigQuery, Let's say, for example, you drop a huge data set into uh, a couple tables, and you want to let your analysts loose on it um, and say, OK, guys, query all you want. But you actually don't want to spend as much as, say, they want to query. They, they're going to go, well, OK, well, is there a limit? Yes, there is a limit. And you can actually set quotas for how much querying people can do inside of, big, uh, inside of BigQuery. Um, you can do it across all users. You can do it by project. And so that's a way of um, controlling the cost and controlling what you're spending. Um, on your different products. So um, I hope that this kind of gives you some idea and, and gets your mind kind of uh, churning and, and thinking about the different ways to kind of get the best value for what you spend out of data processing pipelines. Um, really, it's, it's important to understand what the products do first, but then how they interact with each other. Um, to really understand and really get the best out of best ways to budget out. Um, what they are doing.